Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the use of DNA interclators uh, as anti-cancer chemotherapies. So we've now seen three examples of DNA intercalators. We've seen the two amphocyclins, doxorubicin and dornamycin, and we've seen the actinomycin drug, actinomycin D, also referred to as dactinomycin. Right, okay, so we now want to find out what a DNA intercalator actually is. Okay, so for this, let's turn the page over and talk a little bit about the structure of DNA and therefore how these drugs are going to, well, intercalate and what that means. Okay, so let's just make sure we're all on the same page by having a little refresh in our heads of what um, the structure of DNA is. So DNA is made up of nucleotides and my picture of a nucleotide, my cartoon picture of a nucleotide is like so. So here is the sugar, the pentameric deoxyribose sugar here. So you have an oxygen up here in position one and then you have five carbons, one, two, three, four, and then the fifth comes off up here. You then attach this to an organic base. So by the first carbon of the deoxyribose sugar, you attach this to an organic base, okay, which I will just denote as a square here. So let's label up these different pieces. So this represents the organic base, okay, and I think I'll colour it in. So we'll have the organic base in orange, nice happy colour. Okay, so here is orange. Here in orange is the organic base. We'll have the uh, deoxyribose sugar here in green. So remember, we're talking about DNA. So the sugar is not ribose, it's deoxyribose. Specifically, it's 2-deoxyribose. So this is 2-deoxyribose. And what it means to be 2 deoxyribose is that you have taken the alcohol group off the second carbon. So this carbon here, and I'm, these aren't supposed to be skeletal structures, this is literally just a pentagon that's representing the sugar. Um, so off this second carbon here would be an alcohol group, in ribose at least. And in DNA you just don't have that. In deoxyribose you've removed that alcohol group, so you've got two hydrogens coming off this uh, second carbon. Right, so that's the sugar that you use in DNA. And then off this 5' prime carbon, you then have a phosphate group up here. So this is a phosphate group in red. Okay, right, so this is the structure of a nucleotide. So you polymerize these things together to make a single strand of DNA, and then you put two complementary strands of DNA, which are running anti-parallel together to make the double strand of DNA. So, let me show this. So we'll start off with the single strand of DNA. So let's have a single strand of DNA. So here comes our first nucleotide, and we'll only do two nucleotide long uh, piece of DNA, um, because otherwise it'll take far too long. So here is our uh, deoxyribose sugar. Here is our organic base, and let's say we'll give it a specific organic base. We'll say it's guanine, which we'll denote by G. Then off the free prime, uh, off the third carbon of this deoxyribose uh, sugar here, you then attach the phosphate group of the nucleotide that's going to be below. So here comes the nucleotide that's going to be below. So here's the phosphate group of the nucleotide below, and here comes the pentameric 2-deoxyribose uh, sugar here with an organic base sticking off the side. So here, let's have adenine, so A. Now, so that's our uh, piece of DNA. Uh, this is a single strand of DNA at the moment, so we could polymerize this on. We could get another nucleotide and bang it on here, another one after that, and we can continue building the DNA strand. Now, basically, this is not how you find DNA within the cell. You do not find DNA that is single-stranded, or you shouldn't, at least. Uh, instead, it will be bound to another complementary strand of DNA, which will have the complementary organic base to each of these. So the complementary organic base to guanine is cytosine, and the complementary organic base to adenine is thymine. So, what you'll have is you'll have um, a cytosine here, I'll put the organic bases in first. So here's the cytosine, and it will be 
linked by hydrogen bonds to the guanine, and there are three hydrogen bonds between guanine and cytosine, and then the adenine will be bound to a thymine, and then there are only two hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine. Right, then there's another little complication in that the DNA strand, sorry, the sugar phosphate backbone of the DNA strand does not run in the same direction as the uh, as this first strand. It runs in the opposite direction. So basically I have to draw this thing upside down and that is what is meant by the two DNA strands running anti-parallelly, uh, which I don't think is a word, in anti-parallel fashion maybe would be a better way of phrasing that. Okay, so let me attempt to draw this now upside down in as best a way as I can. So here is our deoxyribose, here comes the fifth carbon, here is the phosphate, okay? Now let's put the deoxyribose here. So here's our next deoxyribose, with, it's going to attach to that phosphate there, its fifth carbon comes off here, and its phosphate goes up here. So basically, um, the fifth carbons are pointing in this direction for this first strand, and they're pointing in this direction for the second strand, and that's what is known as anti-parallel. The two strands are said to be anti-parallel to one another. Okay, so they are alongside one another, but they're running in opposite directions. Their orientations are exactly the opposite of one another. Okay, right. So this is a 2D picture, but of course this structure is three-dimensional, so you don't just have this running in a plane. Instead, if we can make the picture a little bit cheaper now, I'm going to make the picture cheaper. So instead of um, having the sugar phosphate backbone drawn out nice and beautifully like this, it's going to be demoted down to just two lines running like so. Okay, so the whole thing has now been reduced down to just two lines. These two lines represent the two complementary strands. So this represents this. So one of these is one of the strands. So this here represents what was previously drawn as an entire thing here. Okay, and actually I think I'll, I think I'll go for maybe a... No, actually I'll stick with this for now. Well, basically, you don't have it just in a plane like this. Instead, if you can imagine holding these two ends down, so let's say we blue tack the two ends down here, and then twisting these two strands around one another. So, twist this one this way, and twist this one this way, okay? And what will you get? You'll end up with something that looks like... And I won't draw too much of this. Okay, and this one goes backwards initially, and then up like this. Okay, so you'll end up with something that looks like this. So let me highlight the two strands in a separate colour to show them. So this is this red one here. Okay, and let's have the other one in green. So basically the two strands twist around one another. Okay, now the sugar phosphate backbone is really what I've shown here. Now, as you can see, the, um, the sugar phosphate backbone is gradually going up in this fashion, but basically the organic bases are very, very much so flat. They are planar molecules, i.e. if you were to actually see one of these things uh, in 3D, they lie in a perfect plane, so um, guanine really is like a box, well not like a box in fact, like a uh, flat plate, so they look basically like this, they're very very flat. Now what you do is if I draw this picture bigger, I'm going to try and add the organic bases in, so I'm going to draw this picture bigger now, so let me try and do this as best as I can, okay, and it's best probably not to do as much, to only have it going up like there, that'll do. Okay, so this one is this pink strand again, so now the green strand needs to go into the page and then needs to come out of the page again and go up there. Okay, so that's that. Uh, those are the two um, strands of DNA. Well, these are the two pho sugar phosphate backbones of the DNA. So in red here is this red strand again. Okay. 
and here in green is the green strand. Right, now let's add some organic bases in. Basic, oops. Basically, the organic bases are completely opposite to the direction in which the uh, DNA is moving. So the DNA is moving up this axis here, and the organic bases sit in a plane that is perpendicular to uh, that uh, axis. So, if we show some organic bases, now where is the best space to put these organic bases? So maybe I'll start with here. So the organic bases will lie within this plane here. So I'm trying to show them um, lying in the plane. So here's this other one lying in the plane. So really, if we were to actually look at it from the side, we just see a line basically because they're not, they don't, if I draw another one here, they're just lying in this plane. So really, to see them properly, we'd have to look from above. So if we were to look from above, let's say we look at this portion here from above, what we'd see is we'd see the green strand coming up like this, okay? So I've just drawn this portion of the green strand here, okay? So we are looking at these organic bases here. So this portion of the green strand is from here to here. So this end here corresponds to this here, so I'll label it up. This is point one, here is point one. This is point two, here is point two. Now let's add the red strand on. So uh, the red strand is out here then. So the red strand will begin, so this is, let's say, point three. The red strand will begin here at point three, and then we'll go round to point four up here, okay? So it will come round like this, like so. Okay, and this is point four over here. Then what you'll find is that the, this organic base that we've shown here as just a line, because we're looking at it from the wrong angle, this will now, we'll see it like that. So we'll see them now. They're, they're lying in this plane, basically, is what I've... This is exhaustingly... Uh, um, explained as. So basically, the point is that the DNA strand progresses in this plane, but the organic bases are lying in the plane perpendicular to the axis up which the DNA strand is moving. So, basically you have organic bases stacked one on top of each other. So if I draw this, let's have another organic base down here. So here's another organic base pair. And the, there's this gap, this, this gap in between these two planes of organic bases here. And a DNA intercalator is a molecule which is also planar, which can sit in between here. So again, if we look at it from the side, we're not going to see much. We're just going to see the side of it because it's a nice planar molecule. It's like a CD, if you like, and it's slotting in this sort of um, little... Um, gap that you've got here between the two, um, the roof and the floor, which are um, these two planes of complementary organic bases here. Okay, so that is what a DNA intercalator does. It's a planar molecule that can slide in between uh, the uh, organic bases, the layers of the organic bases. So this is a DNA intercalator. Now, let's go back to the molecules that I have told you are DNA intercalators and see why they are, will be good at doing this. So, doxorubicin and dornamycin are the only ones we've seen the structures of. And these aromatic rings, this entire structure here, these four rings joined together, lies in a complete plane. So it's just a, you know, a beautifully planar molecule. It's like a CD that you are putting into a CD rack, basically. It slides in between those two, um, two pieces of organic bases, two planes of organic bases below and above it. In fact, that's probably quite a good comparison. So the DNA strand is like a CD rack, some snazzy CD rack. And the organic bases are the metal holders for the CD. And the DNA intercalator is like the CD slotting into that gap between the holders. Okay, right. So, what is the effect of putting these DNA intercalators into DNA? Does it do nothing? Uh, well, evidently not, because these are incredibly powerful anti-cancer drugs. So, what does it do? 
Well, basically, it causes the DNA to unfold because the DNA intercalator doesn't just slide in there. What it does is it also starts interacting with the organic bases and what it tries to do, basically, is bring the organic bases on top of one another. So, let me explain this in a bit more detail. So, if we highlight this pair of organic bases below the DNA intercalator in turquoise, then if we look at those on this diagram, they will not be in the same position as this pair here. They will be at this sort of an angle like this. Okay, so can I try and draw these on top of this diagram? Okay, so here's this other one going in like this. And you'll have some sort of gap there. Okay, so the, the point is that they are, they are not what exactly on top of one another. So what the DNA intercalator will try and do is it will try and move this top one so that it is uh, in line with the one underneath. So it will basically move this organic base here in this sort of a direction and this one here in this sort of a direction. So what it's going to do actually is unwind the DNA. So if we show it on this um, picture here, what's going to happen is that the DNA might go from looking like this to say looking instead something like this. It, will, it won't completely get rid of the twist uh, in the DNA, but it will reduce it basically. So in the same length of DNA, we turn much less frequently basically uh, once the DNA intercalator is sliding between all of our organic bases. And it's because the DNA intercalator wants to interact not only with the uh, organic base that it's sitting on, but it also wants to interact with the organic base above. And it's most uh, able to do that if it slides these two uh, layers of organic bases so that they are uh, right above one another. And that involves unwinding the DNA, basically. So it's going to lead to the unwinding of the DNA. Okay, and we'll discuss the consequences of that for the cell in the next video.